Welcome to the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. Today we're talking about personal branding and what that means for, for geospatial people, for professionals like us. Now you might hear personal branding and think, yeah, well that's great. I don't want to be an influencer. This is not for me. Personal branding is about creating opportunities for yourself. It is the opportunity to have a voice and it's the responsibility that comes with having that voice. And it's not about being noticed by everyone. It's about being noticed by a very specific someone. But I will let Helena Mershtoff, an expert in marketing and personal branding, and with a really strong background in GIS geospatial, talk more about that in just a second. But first, I think it's worth mentioning that the reason why I wanted to create this episode is because I believe that the vast majority of us have an obscurity problem. I think for the vast majority of us, the problem is not that we cannot help someone. It's that no one knows that we can help them. And I think personal branding could go a long way to solving your obscurity problem and give you the opportunities that that you are looking for. Hey, Helena, welcome to the podcast. It's really great to have you here. Um, You live just down the road from me and you've got this incredible GIS background. I think you're working on a PhD at the moment. And you're also a marketer. And this is why I've invited you on the podcast today, because you have a foot in each of of these two fields, GIS, geospatial and marketing. And my hope for this conversation today is to talk about personal branding, how we do it, why we need it and and what the results might be. So with with that sort of brief introduction from my side, perhaps you could put some more words around that. Maybe you could introduce yourself to the audience, perhaps give us an understanding of your GIS, geospatial background, and then we'll head off into personal branding from there. Yeah, cool. Hey, hey, Daniel, and hey, everyone. Firstly, thank you for having me on. And as uh, yeah, as you mentioned, Daniel, I am a very odd combination of marketer and you know GIS person. I suppose I wouldn't call myself a specialist in GIS, but I do have a background in GIS, and I am doing a PhD in the field of GIS. So yeah, really, that was where my career started in GIS in 2013-ish after finishing a master's in GIS at the University of Salzburg in Austria. Um, And then after that, I kind of pursued a dual career in GIS, but also dabbling more and more in the marketing field. So I initially started with a translation company because I also have a um, background in translation. And from there, went more and more into the language aspect and more into the writing, into the copywriting, into the content writing. And that naturally led me into the world of branding and ultimately personal branding is a big part of that. And yeah, so now what I do these days mainly is uh, helping GIS associated companies, so geospatial, anything to do with you know, be it um, satellite data, be it uh, building footprints, be it typical kind of GIS service providers or um, platform owners, all of that kind of stuff, helping the businesses and the individuals within those businesses better market their business, market themselves through kind of really building a solid kind of process around their brand message, I guess you could call it. And that applies to the personal brand as much as it applies to a corporate brand. So yeah, that's my background. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Do do you think GIS people, GIS companies, when we think about their messaging, that their their branding, their communication, do they face any sort of particular struggles or challenges around communicating this idea? Or is is, is this symptomatic of, of what every tech company struggles with? How do we communicate what we do to people that might care? It is quite symptomatic of tech in general. So I think what what a big challenge is for GIS companies and for, for, for a lot of other tech companies as well is that they're so, you know, in the subject matter and they're, and they're experts in what they do and they get excited about the products they create, the services they provide, that they really kind of don't consider how to articulate that in a way that someone who's a little bit more outside of that world understands. And I mean, don't get me wrong, they they try very, very hard. And there's a lot of thought that goes into, well, who's our customer and what do they need and all that. But where they often trip up is like the the, and the knowledge bias, I guess you could call it, you know, it's kind of identifying how much like outsiders know about 
the product or service you're providing and and where to pick up like where to attach your message to in their uh you know worldview i suppose so um let's talk about you know writing a website for example so a lot of gis companies their websites are really generic you know so it'll be something like we provide xyz solutions and here are some use cases and here's a couple of testimonials type of thing but it's not really ever contextualized into the market or what they need you know so so very few gis companies or many other tech companies will actually start their website with the problem and and really understand well this is the problem we're solving um and this is what the problem sounds like in the audience's you know perspective so what then happens is that the audience has like not that much background information on GIS they don't really know all the ins and outs and they go on the website and they'll see something like we provide xyz solutions but they're not talking the same language and yeah i guess that is symptomatic of tech in general but you know with GIS i suppose there is a lot less understanding than around like several other kind of tech um industries i suppose you know so people will have a, a higher level of pre-existing knowledge about what to expect from say accounting software than what to expect from you know a um GIS platform that they can bring into their company to help their engineers better document their boreholes or something like that so so it's much less known i suppose to the general public yeah so 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 that makes a lot of sense and i can definitely see how other technical industries would struggle with the same thing. Or I'd like to come back to this idea of insiders and outsiders, because I think that's going to be really important when we move off into a conversation around personal branding. But let's save that for later on. So the promise of the episode is personal branding. People will be scared off by that personal branding. Like, do I need a logo? <laughs> do I have to decide which colors I'm going to use kind of thing when they think about a, a personal brand? Maybe you could help sort of demystify this a little bit. What what does a personal brand mean to you? So really a personal brand is just the way that you are perceived in the marketplace or or, or just by everyone, right? So it's not even necessarily related to your professional life, although that's generally where we like to go with it, but it's really a culmination of your skills, your experiences, your values, your personality, and it's how you put yourself out there, right? So the way that this generally looks is in an online sense. So, you know, let's take LinkedIn for an example, because it's a really great platform um, where we see a lot of very successful personal branding, you know, so it'll be where you demonstrate your skills and, and expertise, but you put that in context of your own personality, you know, so you, so you might create a really cool map that you want to show the world, but what you depict on that map will reflect your own personal values, right? So, um, you know, you won't make a map about something you don't care about. You'll make a map about something that's important to you. So, you know, that will resonate with other people on the internet, on LinkedIn, who care about the same stuff. And it also shows your expertise, right? So it shows that you can make a really, really cool map. But it also helps to put your personality a little bit at the forefront of things as well. So, that's just one example in terms of like what kind of content you put out there. But then again, it's also not just LinkedIn content. It's also everything um, else that you do, the way that you show up in the world, you know, whether you are at an event, the topics you're speaking about at an event, how you interact with others at an event. It's just your entire public facing approach to how you promote yourself, I suppose, would be a, a way to summarize that. <laughs> so that uh, people can understand what you stand for as an individual and what you're all about, really. I think people will be scared off by that idea of self-promotion because it feels kind of icky for, for a lot of people. Can you talk to us a little bit more about self-promotion? Because it sounds like I could almost take out self-promotion and, and put in showing my work and perhaps it would have the same uh, impact. Yeah, I think it goes deeper than just showing your work. And like, it's definitely not about bragging or just kind of, you know, talking about yourself all the time. So I, I guess an, a nicer way of looking at it is sharing your skills and talents with the world in a way that creates value for other people, right? So what it often comes down to is educating. So, you know, if you've got a really unique perspective, if you've got a really unique skill set, for instance, in, in my case with the GIS and the marketing, people would say to me like, well, that's such an interesting combination. Can you explain to me how 
I can do this and this for my GIS company, you know, because they value my expertise from that unique perspective. And then I can educate them about, you know, in this and this case for your GIS company, you know, this is how I see it. And this is how I think you could add some value. And this is how I would go about helping you create the brand message and whatnot. So, so I can offer my perspective to them and they find that valuable, right? And it's the same for every single person out there. Every single person has a unique perspective on everything, right? And it is shaped by who you are as a person, by your combination of work experience and life experience and education and your, you know, maybe even hobbies outside of work and all of that. So it's about sharing that perspective with the world that is really what thought leadership is right because we always hear about thought leadership and you know people think it's this big scary thing where you have to invent new stuff but it's not it's about looking at a existing concept or you know you can create a new concept if you're like really at at the top of your game but most of the time it's about taking existing things and putting them into your own context and sharing them with the world right adding your own two cents worth to a conversation and educating people about something from your perspective. And so that's what you're adding. You're adding your own unique perspective to the topic that you want to be discussing. And you're sharing it with the world in a way that hopefully makes people care. And that's all it is. Do you need to have a a goal in mind when you do this, when you, when you sort of embark on the journey of creating a personal brand? So, so firstly, I think probably everybody has a personal brand already. People think of them in a certain way that they react to them when they come in the room in a certain way, based on the way they've shown up before. So in in that way, we we have personal brands. But if, if I decide like, Hey, I want to build my reputation online because I think it would be good for my career, because I think it would be good for my business, help me make more sales, or help me network. Do I need a goal in mind when, when, I, when I start this? Or can I just start sharing things that I'm, that I'm interested in and, and like showing, hey, I, I have this perspective on this. I, I do it like this. My thoughts on, on this topic are. Well, it works both ways around, actually. So, um, you know, a lot of people who are now really well-established influencers, I suppose, um, and that's slightly different from you know, your typical personal brand, which we can talk about later, but a lot of today's influences. So, you know, people with like a million plus following on any given social network, you know, they say, well, I just started because I just wanted to share my journey. I just wanted to document my journey. And, you know, they were just on the right platform at the right time to garner then, you know, a the, the, get the traction to create this massive following. Because when a platform is really young, it rewards creators with a lot of free organic kind of views. So now if you put something on Instagram now, basically no one will see it. But when Instagram was really, really new, if you put something up there, then it would get shown to a lot of Instagram users who were not in your network to reward creators who were actively putting stuff on Instagram because Instagram grows by people putting stuff on Instagram. So it's like an incentive. And then When a platform reaches a certain level of maturity, it really takes down that organic reach and people have to work really, really hard to reach audiences, especially new audiences on these platforms. So a lot of people who are now really well known on the internet, they had a really easy ride to get there because they started when it was new, when it was fresh, you know, think of early YouTube adopters and that kind of stuff. You don't get that kind of following these days, you know, so, so they might have not started with the goal in mind to become a massive influencer and it just kind of happened. Nowadays, it's quite different. So if you want to create a lot of influence online, it's a very intentional thing. But that said, you know, the very smallest fraction of personal brands are actually influencers. And most people can create a very successful personal brand without needing to be, you know, overly strategic about it. So it really depends what you want to achieve, how far you want to take this thing. If you just want a little more visibility, then really it's enough to look at what you can offer the world, like really think about what are your perspectives, what is your expertise, what can you add, like what value can you add to which conversations, like which rooms do you need to put yourself in virtually, like, you know, in Twitter or certain Facebook groups or on LinkedIn, like where do you need to show up and what can you add? And then if you just start doing that, then the opportunities tend to find you. So 
you might not end up with one and a half million followers and be able to quit your day job and make money online doing nothing but sharing your thoughts. But you will have an abundance of opportunities more than likely from something that's not necessarily a huge chunk of your day, from something that's not necessarily a big strategic undertaking, if you know what I mean. Could you perhaps walk me through what it would mean for me? Like, so I want to be strategic about my personal brand, but what it would mean for me, I'm in a job that I, I want to grow. I want to try something else or I want to, you know, I, I want to move up the ladder because I, I think a lot of people will be able to relate to this. How do you think my, and I realize this is very general, but what, what kind of sort of general approach should I be looking at in terms of, you know, increasing my visibility, you know, creating the, this brand and being intentional about it? Well, the first step that I would always look at is thinking about who you want to get in front of, right? So, I mean, if we relate it to corporate branding, it's the idea of knowing your customer, knowing your audience. Now, for a personal brand, it's, you know, you don't have a customer, you just want to stand out a little more in your chosen field, right? So you look at, well, who's in my field? Who do I want to stand out to? Like, who do I want to be noticed by? And then you really want to understand what you've got to offer this crowd of people, right? So like, okay, say you want to be noticed by, you know, the sea level of certain companies that you might be aspiring to work at, then you want to understand, well, what are these people interested in? What are they looking for? Like you, you can go and look at their profiles. You can have a look at uh, what they're talking about. You can join the conversations on their profiles, you know? So if you've, if you've got someone and you want them to become aware of you, then you look at their, you know, say, say, let's just stick with LinkedIn. You look at their LinkedIn profile, you look at what they post, if they post anything, and you can start commenting on their posts, you know, adding your thoughts on their posts rather than even having to, you know, have your own content strategy at this point in time. You can really start just engaging online with the people that you want to notice you. And they will notice that maybe not the first time, you know, if you're engaging with someone who gets a lot of engagement, you know, you might not stand out that much, but they will definitely notice if you show up over and over again, adding thoughtful, insightful comments or, you know, engaging with them on their terms, on their platforms, on their content, they will notice you. And after a couple of engagements, you know, you can even on LinkedIn, this is what makes LinkedIn so cool that you can actually add people to your network and then they will be following you as well as you following them. So, you know, on Instagram, you can follow someone, but that still doesn't mean they follow you back. Whereas on LinkedIn, you can, you know, add them and then they can see your stuff and you can see theirs. Now, I, I'm not suggesting you go and just add random CEOs who you've never engaged with because most of them will not accept your request. But after you've kind of built this relationship a little bit by engaging with them and with their content, and then you can send them a request, you know, add a personal like thoughtful message, something like, hey, I've been loving your content and, uh, you know, um, we share X, Y, Z views on this. And um, I'd really love to see more of your content on my feed. Um, bang, send it off. And, you know, after they've noticed you on their content, the chances of them reciprocating favorably by accepting your request are quite high, right? So you build your network firstly by inviting the right people in with this approach that I've just outlined. And then you can start thinking about, well, what can I share with them now on my page? Like what's the content that I can create additionally to engaging in other people's content what's the content that i can create that will be of value or of interest like what are my unique perspectives what are my skill sets my expertise and then you're just putting start putting stuff like that out there you know it doesn't have to be you don't have to be posting two three times a day you can think about you know once or twice a week what could i share you know it might even be like resharing someone else's post but adding your opinion to it um you know when you've got that little um, blurb at the top where it's like this is what you said and then it shares the other person's post and that again will make that person whose post you shared notice you and, and stuff like that so you start really the, the the best way to start is by engaging with other people on their terms on their content and then you get noticed by them by their network because their whole network sees your comment right it's not just that the person who posted sees your comment everyone in their network also sees it so so you really just start 
having a voice and not being afraid to use it. And then people will start noticing and you can build that network and then start putting out that content. Now, once you know, obviously, what you want to say, so this is really where you go back to your own, you know, go, go back to your own skills, your own expertise, um, and then you really just start talking about that. And all of that comes way before the need for a logo or anything like that, you know, which you said would be daunting for people. So a lot of people do this who are not necessarily even looking for a new position or who are not necessarily wanting to go out on their own or freelance or build a business. It's really about thinking, how can I join the right conversations, right? So it's, it's no different to networking at a conference. You join the right conversations and you add your unique perspective to those conversations. And then perhaps you get up on stage and you do a presentation. So it's the same concept, just this time you're doing it online, right? And you're doing it continuously, not just twice a year. <laughs> I was listening to a, a podcast once and that you'd be surprised to know that I listen to a lot of podcasts. This person was talking about interviewing a pilot. And he was talking about the three f- favorite subjects of this pilot was flying, me, and me flying. And what this highlighted for me was, yeah, that's right. People love to talk about themselves. And you were talking about so adding your own twist to other people's content, like engaging with it. And I think it's probably worth noting here that yeah, a thoughtful question is also a really valuable thing. What, what did you mean by that? Like, could you explain that more? I've experienced this differently, but you don't always have to have a new twist. You could just be looking for more. And I think that would also get you noticed by the right kind of people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess a lot of the time, even especially what's cool in tech is that a lot of these people, even the really good ones, don't get a lot of engagement. And and why why is that good? I mean, you know, so if you look at, if you're connected with marketers on LinkedIn and they post something and it can be, it can be something really not valuable to put it bluntly. And they'll get like a thousand comments saying like, oh, great post. Or like, oh, I love this. Or just really, you know, not insightful comments. And then a tech person will post something really, really valuable and they might get three or four comments and they'll all be valuable comments or asking for more context, as you say. And that actually, that's actually a conversation. Whereas, you know, this other stuff, this like low value, high engagement content, it's a lot of the time it's just pods anyway, liking each other's stuff and having to comment on each other's stuff to get like the return engagement and reach and whatever. I mean, that's a strategy in itself, but it's not a very good one. But in the tech world, even if you have a question and you can spark a conversation that will get you way deeper, way quicker with someone than, you know, if you just comment something like, oh, great post, you know. <laughs> so um, there's, there's a lot of opportunity and we really should be seeking those conversations and not just seeing it as like, this is my mandatory five minutes of engagement for Monday, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I completely agree. I think too, it's getting more and more important to stand out. When I look at these platforms, they're, they're very, very standardized. It's, it's difficult to, to really stand out on LinkedIn. I mean, you can use the right keywords and, and make yourself discoverable. If someone's searching you know, uh, for a, a position to fill, uh, they've got a, a new role that they need someone for. I think that that's a strategy too. But in general, it's, stand, it's, it's tough to stand out. But it, I think that, that engagement, that conversation is where the magic can happen. So I, I would hope people would use this as a, a way of standing out in the crowd because most people aren't engaging. Most people are, are just consuming. I think it's, it's super important to, to start sort of building this. And, but, th- but those are my thoughts. I'd like to hear your thoughts on when is a great time to start building a personal brand? Should I, should I start immediately? Should I wait until I know a little bit more? Can I grow with my brand? Can I change my mind along the way? Do I need to wait until I'm sort of stable in my career? What are your thoughts around that? Well, I think, as you said earlier, everybody has a personal brand already, you know, so it's how other people perceive you and it grows with you and it and it pivots with you. And it's something that you can either cultivate intentionally or you can just leave it up to chance how other people perceive you or don't perceive you. You know, you, you can kind of just like blend in I suppose or you can do a little bit more active you know you can be a bit more proactive about it and then start standing out and then if you have a career change if you pivot your role your industry then you can just kind of flow that into the story that you're telling right so it's really 
something that's never, you know, now is the best time to start. What was the whole thing about planting a tree, you know, 20 years ago um, was the best time, but now is the second best time, right? So if you haven't taken control of that narrative of how you're perceived by actively kind of cultivating that through your engagements, through your content, through what you put out there through how you know the the speaking events you perhaps engage in or the networking you do then now is a good time to start doing all of that no matter where you're at in your career you know and it will look different depending on where you're at if you're you know early in your career then it'll be possibly a lot more um you know all over the place than if you've got a really well established career and you've already got some degree of like you know, reputation behind you and people have certain expectations and, um, you know, they might have heard you speaking here and there and they kind of know what you're about and now you just, you know, integrate a new channel into that, say, okay, well, I'm going to pursue LinkedIn. And so you look at like, what am I known for? What do people expect of me? And you can start putting that content out on LinkedIn additionally to the conferences that you normally speak at and so on and so forth. So it depends on where you're at in your career will probably it'll look different but it's definitely something for everyone to be doing from you know the moment that they recognize the need and gain the courage I suppose in a way like it's it's a lot of the time what puts people off is more that they're just scared of doing it rather than not having something to add to the conversation I think everyone has something to add to the conversation everyone has valuable ideas and insights and experiences. Everyone has valuable stories to tell. Everyone is a person who has something to contribute, but it's really about when, when do you kind of get over the inertia or the fear of actually doing it? And that's something where I just want to give everyone just a little push and say, come on, it starts small. Start by setting yourself a goal of maybe engaging with five people a day on LinkedIn or whatever your favorite platform is. You know, you don't have to go on all channels at once. You don't have to start creating content at once. Just start small and build from there and build your confidence because really the difference is only the difference between people whose personal brands are helping them be successful and those whose personal brands are just kind of existing in an uncultivated manner is the confidence to execute and you know executing consistently that's the only difference i really appreciate that call to action and i appreciate the fact that you you recognize that hey that there is something called imposter syndrome and there'll be a lot of people that listen to this and think well i don't have anything to add to the conversation or you know i'm not good enough to add something to the conversation another thing people might be thinking is oh this is too niche what would you say to those people what do you mean with too niche Oh, this is so niche. I'm I'm interested in the geospatial and and surfing. I'm interested in this and and this other thing. The the small sort of intersection, the Internet of Things, and how it relates to robot vacuum cleaners. <laughs> These are stupid examples, but <laughs> you can you can see where I'm going. They're becoming very niche. I think you're a great example of this. GIS, geospatial, and marketing. You, there's very few uh, you know people like you that fit in that same Venn diagram. And so my question is this idea of being too niche, too niche for anyone to care about. Well, the thing is that with the saturation or the oversaturation of every single platform and the internet in general these days, the only thing that will ever stand out is something that's niche, right? (laughs) So staying with me as an example, when I was just kind of a general marketer, I had far less inquiries than when I decided to kind of take the bold step of narrowing it down to only GIS. You know, I I recognize I have the GIS expertise and the marketing expertise. Why not focus on just that, right? And that's when I started getting a lot more of the right kind of inquiries, the, you know, the exact thing that fits my skill sets and interests, because then those people can recognize that you're not just a generalist, you're there just for them, right? And I mean, that might not be transferable to someone who likes GIS and vacuum cleaners <laughs> because, uh, you know, the, the question I would ask there is like, what, what's the need for the overlap in that skill set? If there is any kind of need in the overlap of your skill set, even if you think like it's, it's too small, like it's not too small, 
but if it's completely unrelated, if it's like surfing and GAs or vacuum cleaners and GAs, then perhaps don't stick with that intersection, but look at GIS and, you know, from a, from your professional only lens, let's put it. So let's leave the hobbies out of it and say, okay, from a professional lens, what can I bring to the GIS table? And if it's like, okay, well, I'm just, so to speak, a GIS generalist, um, then what's your favorite part about GIS? You know, like what, what do you like doing? Do you like doing network analysis? Do you like creating maps? Do you like working more on the intersection to geology? Do you like working in a certain industry? Like, do you, do you like doing analyses for a certain industry and so on and so forth? Like everyone will have certain preferences within that because, you know, GIS in itself is huge. Um, there are so many different applications, so many different use cases, so many different skill sets that contribute to that. Look there, what have you got there? Or, or even if it's not, that you think like, well, I'm an expert here. Think about what do you enjoy? What do you want to become an expert in? What do you want your next career move to look like? And then start talking about those things. And I mean, the thing with imposter syndrome is like, it's, it's good to an extent, right? So you don't want to talk about something you know nothing about because that's, you know, not particularly authentic. People will pick up on it. It's not going to position you, you know, in the, in the best light. But it helps you stay in your lane. So, you know, if you've got imposter syndrome, but you say, well, actually, this is something I can talk confidently about, then let the imposter syndrome guide you in that and say, right, what are the topics that I can confidently speak on and start there? And then, you know, grow as your career grows and stick with what you know. That is some really helpful advice. I appreciate that. Thank you. We, we talked a little bit about channels. I, I know that you have a strong focus on LinkedIn. What would you suggest to other people? Like what, what channel should they use and, and, and why? So I think ultimately, you know, coming back to the whole idea of where to start with branding, um, where, you know, my answer was think about who you're talking to or who you want to be talking to. I think the channels that you should be using should be guided by the people who, who you want to be talking to, where they hang out, right? So it's similar, to, again, to the conference analogy. Like if you are, you know, a specialist in a certain, you know, say say open source GIS or something, uh, then, you know, the, the place where you probably go to connect with other like-minded people are kind of more open source type conferences, whereas, um, you know, certain other conferences might not be for you or your audience at all. And it's the same online. So where are the people hanging out that, would really appreciate your perspective because they share the same interests, the same kind of um, ideas, you know, is that uh, LinkedIn? Is it Twitter? You know, is it uh, Instagram? If it's all more visual um, based, is it Facebook even? Are, uh, you know, is it podcasts? Where are the people that you want to reach? Um, and then, you know, you start there. And a lot of really successful influencers uh, will only ever stick to one platform. Um, whereas if you're kind of, you know, not hugely specialized in one particular platform, then you can kind of go across platforms. You can start with one and then build out to another if your time investment allows that. But in general, I would look at having one social platform, a dominant social platform, um, and then having a place, obviously, where you can provide more in-depth information. So if people become alert to you through your social content, where can they find out more? You know, is it a personal website? Is it a blog? Is it a podcast? Like, if they've enjoyed the little snippets, where can they get to know you a little better? You know, some people have a newsletter, all that kind of thing. So look at all of that. Uh, look at what your preferred format is, you know, is it like, well, I like doing little videos, then maybe, you know, you wouldn't be suited to like a very text heavy platform, you might go to a more visual platform, or I like doing, um, you know, I like writing long form content, then you might want to start uh, with a blog and create some little excerpts from that that you put onto some of the more short form social media platforms to get people onto your blog and so on. So you look at where are the people hanging out that you want to reach and you look at what are your preferences? How do you like to engage? How do you like to create? And where, you know, where do they intersect? Where do they overlap? And that's probably the place to start. I think it's probably worth adding to that. It's worth considering what can I maintain 
over a longer period of time. For me anyway, I can't see a great deal of value of just showing up once every fourth month with something, unless it's like a, a, a massive amount. Maybe it takes you that long to make that thing. But I think that consistency is, is really important. So yeah, you might like making small videos, but if it takes you, you know, four months to make a small video, I think may, maybe you have to think about something that you can do on a consistent basis, how it fits in with your life, how it can become a, a bit of a routine. Otherwise, I, I think it's going to become unwieldy for a lot of people and they're going to you know, lose interest and lose focus. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that you hit the nail on the head. That's um, you know, consistency is the ultimate deciding factor between you know success and failure of a intentional brand. So yeah, definitely. So we, we talked a little bit about this idea of a successful personal brand. Do you have any examples that you could share with with the listeners? And the idea being that they had somewhere that they could go and look at and go, oh, okay, wow, look at this person. They're doing this, this, and that and get a feel for for what's working for them and hopefully maybe a recipe for you know what what they could do as well. Yeah, so I mean I've I've mentioned a couple of times that there are kind of different tiers I suppose um of personal branding. Um and I think the thing that stops a lot of people from pursuing creating their personal brand is as you said the imposter syndrome which can be it can come from looking at the wrong people to compare themselves to, right? So A lot of people, when they think personal brand, they think influencers and influencers are people, you know, in the tech space um, and LinkedIn would be someone like Steve Nury, you know, so um, he's very much an influencer in the tech AI space and it's his sole job from what I can tell, you know, his, you know, he's a full-time influencer and he's got 1.5 million followers on LinkedIn thousands of likes and comments and reshares every time he posts something and I mean fair enough he posts really really good valuable thought leadership content he is always at like the forefront of the industry so that's kind of an influencer right he has one dominant platform which is LinkedIn so I found him on Instagram he's got something like 900 followers whereas his um, LinkedIn is 1.5 million so you know, he focuses his time and energy on LinkedIn. But I think what the challenge is when, you know, when people start out and they think, I want to build a personal brand, what are the successful guys doing? And then they'll go to someone like Steve's profile and they'll see, well, he posts like on average every six hours. Like I can't do that, (laughs) you know, but that's not comparable to what most people are or should be doing so so this is like the different tiers of personal branding so here so influencers are at the very top right so a million followers it's basically their full-time income it opens them the doors to countless opportunities you know so um they can be invited to speaking events they can do sponsored content all that kind of stuff but that's really their thing it's it's their social media presence is their job and then kind of below that, I suppose, the, the next tier is like micro influences, I guess. And um, th- there's no firm numbers around what makes, what constitutes a micro influencer. Is it someone with uh, 50,000 followers? Is it someone with 5,000 followers? There'll be different takes on this. But what I consider a micro influencer, I suppose, is someone with a really strong social media presence, but who still has a day job, you know. so their strong social media presence is like the strongest example of a personal brand you can probably find out there. And it's going to be taking up, you know, 20 plus hours of work for them a week, maybe, maybe 10 to 20 hours, depending on kind of how deep they go with their content. So this is really a big part of their lives. Like it's a big additional um, time expense, additionally to their day job. Um, And they have a lot of influence because of it. So you know, in the GIS space, we're looking at people like Matt Forrest, um, Alistair Dickinson, like both 20-ish K followers, but they're active across a variety of channels. So, you know, it's not just the LinkedIn, it's also then uh, linking to YouTube channels and newsletters and all of that content takes a lot of time to create. So even that tier, I wouldn't be looking at to compare one's self to unless you're really aspiring to be an influencer. Then the personal brand tier, that's really, you know, that's everyone. That is hard to point to specific examples of people because basically it's it's everyone who's posting content on LinkedIn or on any platform. It's 
it's people who are consistently showing up and they might have a hundred followers, they might have a thousand, they might have 10,000. It's people who are consistently showing up, adding valuable content, but their successes often fly under the radar. So, you know, you might have someone in your network who is just posting interesting stuff from time to time. And you and I will never know what opportunities that has afforded them, right? So un unless they talk about it, you don't know whether that job change that they had like three months ago was because someone found their content and headhunted them. You know, we don't know that. I've, uh, you know, personally, I've heard a lot of stories of people who have told me that that's happened to them, you know, so they were posting interesting content and then they, someone started following them uh, like out of the blue and that person never engaged with their content but then emailed them and asked you know hey would you be interested in having a conversation about a new job and you know offered them an amazing job kind of thing so the thing with a lot of this personal branding stuff is and the success that flows from it is that the people who will open the doors for you usually do not engage in your content so you don't know who's watching, you don't know who's listening. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, they might approach you and, you know, an opportunity will just come out of nowhere, seemingly out of nowhere, but it's not out of nowhere because you've established a relationship with them without really noticing th them sitting on the sidelines watching, you know. So um, it's kind of like, I suppose, taking it back to the conference of, you're delivering valuable kind of speeches conference for conference and then you've got a keynote and someone comes up to you and presents you an opportunity the chances are it's not the first time they've seen you the chances are they've kind of been watching and they've kind of been following along um, and then they make their move and it's the same with personal brands and that's why it's really hard to show you who's successful and who isn't because we don't really know that until you talk to people and and people will tell you uh, I personally can tell you starting to post on LinkedIn changed everything for me, right? So um, especially once I niched it really specific to my niche, you know, I was getting so many inquiries by people who I hadn't even really noticed, but they were there, they were watching, they were listening. All of a sudden they reach out and they have these great opportunities for you. And the only thing that led to those opportunities in my case and in, in many people I've spoken to is the consistent putting your message out there, the consistent content creation. So, I mean, what you can do is go on LinkedIn. And again, sorry, it's always LinkedIn. It's just my favorite platform. And it's also the one I'm most familiar with how to actually do this stuff on the platform. You know, you can do a trial for the premium version of LinkedIn, and then you can search for relevant people. It's called Sales Navigator. And when you search for people, you know, you might look for like high level people in GIS companies, geospatial companies, something like that. Then you can actually filter by people who have been active in the last 30 days, I think is the filter. And then what it shows you is all the people who are actually putting up posts, right? So if you search for people in a certain industry, in your industry, even in like a deeper niche of your industry or in a certain position within companies in your industry, and then you sample them by who has posted in the last 30 days, then you can start actually looking at individual profiles and you can see, well, who's got their profile optimized? What have they done? You know, and by, by profile optimized, I mean, who's got the creator mode on, which enables people to follow you. And it also gives you the ability to, to have featured posts at the top of your profile. It, has, it gives you the ability to add a personal website to your bio and all of these things. So who's got their profile optimized? Who's putting out regular content? And what does that look like in you know, the world of your peers, what are the other people doing? And you can gain inspiration from there, but then really bring it back to yourself and your own message and your own expertise and say, okay, now what can this look like for me? What do I want to feature in the featured section of my profile? Maybe I've got like a really amazing piece of work that I've done that I want to showcase. Maybe, um, you know, I've been on a podcast um, where I've you know, spoken about the cool stuff I do and I, maybe I want to feature that, you know, so you've got those three slots where you can feature your coolest stuff for people to go and see. And then you've got your about section where you need to, you know, do a little blurb about yourself. Again, look at what other people are writing, look at what, which ones are good, which ones are bad, you know, which ones appeal to you, which ones are boring. What are the good people all doing that you could do as well, that kind of thing. So 
not everyone with a huge follow account has this all perfect, by the way. <laughs> so um, it's really kind of about understanding the opportunities that you have. So like, you know, for instance, the ability to turn on creator mode and to feature your personal website and to have these featured posts. That's like something that a lot of people just don't know about, but then also bringing it back to, okay, and then what can I post? Like what's, what's going to be relevant for me to add to the conversation and other people might be doing it differently. Maybe that inspires you. Maybe you can kind of emulate that, but then again, don't be afraid to do it your own way and to show your own authentic personality and skill sets. Wow, a ton of great insights there. Thank you very much. I just want to bring it back to this idea of numbers for a start because you start off talking about like this person's got 1.5 million followers. And I think because it's so visual on, on these different social media platforms anyway, how many followers you have, it, people could get lost in this idea of numbers. And, and I, I want to give an example. So there was an essay written a long time ago called A Thousand True Fans. And the idea was that you, know, you could make a living off a thousand true fans if, if you're a creator. If you could get every one of them to give you, you know, $10 a month, well, you know, you could build a life around that kind of thing. But then if you, you take this further and say, well, maybe if I'm a business, I need 100 great customers and I have, you know, an amazing business, depending on what you're selling. Oh, but if I'm an individual throughout my career, I probably only need maybe 12, 15 employers, you know, people that I can work for, people that I can provide a service for. And I hope this makes it more sort of achievable or attainable for folks listening to this, because you, what if you only need 15 people across the entire span of your career to say, to notice you and to want to work with you? Because that, that's quite different from 1.5 million. Yeah, absolutely. No, and that's why I think it's not ideal to be put off by, you know, influences and their metrics, <laughs> because that's not what most of us need or want really, you know? So as you say, I think, if you can go on the platform and engage with 15, 20 people who you've done your research on and you've identified as being really relevant for you to be talking to, you know, get in the room with those people kind of thing, then, you know, your life can change very, very quickly without, you know, building a massive following at all. So, yeah, it's, it's not as big as it appears to be in like the bragging world of the internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is probably a great place to sort of uh, round off the conversation. And I, I want to say thanks. Thank you for you know, sharing your insights. I really appreciate that. Hopefully, you, you have managed to motivate people to, to try this out, to do this. Not because like a personal brand, at least in my mind, is a goal in itself. But if this is the vehicle that's going to help people get to do the work they want to do, to do things that they're interested in and proud of, I think, great. Like if, if one or two people pick up this idea and run with it and end up having a career that, that, that they are grateful for, interested in, then this has been amazing. This has been worth it for me anyway. So thank you very much for your time. I will put links in the show notes to where people can reach out to you, but it's worth mentioning here as well. Uh, if I want to know more about this, uh, if I continue this conversation, where, where should I go to, to talk with you? Well, first of all, thank you. I've really enjoyed our conversation and um, I hope it wasn't, you know, a bombarding um you guys with too much at once um if you look at your linkedin and you think like hey this is a good place to start and i would just love for someone to have a look at it and tell me where my opportunities lie then you know connect with me on linkedin uh, helena mershtoff you can find me um send me a message and you know i'm more than happy to just quickly look over your profile send you back a message and say like hey i reckon you could do this and this um low-hanging fruit just to get started like if that's if that's going to help even just one person get started, I'm more than happy to, you know, do that for you. So, um, you know, obviously free of charge, just send me a message and say, hey, do you want to have a look over this? And I will. That might be for people who are really keen to actually implement this stuff. Otherwise, if you just want to kind of follow along, see what I'm doing, again, LinkedIn's a good place. Um, and yeah, maybe check out my website, which you might be linking in the show notes. So, yeah, that's where you can find all about me. I would definitely put a link to your, your website in the show notes. What, what is the name of that website? What is the URL? So that's tales, T-A-L-E-S dot co dot N-Z. Perfect. Hey, thanks again for your time, Helena. This has been awesome. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you too. I really hope you enjoyed that episode with Helena Merstoff. I'll put links to her website in the show notes, tales.co.nz, and there'll also be a link to her LinkedIn profile. 
And I hope that some of you take her up on that offer. I hope that you reach out to her. And I hope that you start working towards solving your obscurity problem. It's also worth mentioning that I have published a few episodes adjacent to this topic before. And I will put links to those in the show notes of the episode that you're listening right now. So that's worth checking out. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in again this week. It's much appreciated. I'll be back again soon. I hope that you'll take the time to join me then. Bye.